Very nice to see you here tonight, and let's uh, have a close out to our Lord's Day with another study of the Word. And I have a, a Bible character I want to talk with you about for just a minute. It is an Old Testament character. And really, the reason I wanted to focus on him this evening was because of what's, what's said about him and the nature of his association with God. This is the, the Bible character, King David, in the Old Testament. And uh, we're going to look at a few things about his life, but one of the things I want you to remember about him is this big statement that David was a man after God's own heart. And... Uh, there's some good compliments in the Bible uh, to call Abraham the friend of God. That was a big compliment. And to uh, say that Enoch walked with God certainly is a, all those are kind of descriptions you'd like to think about in association with your own life. But that's one of those statements right there. He was a man after God's own heart. How can you say something about a person that represents any greater character than that right there. What, what else would you want to be other than a person after God's own heart? This suggests something about David that's, that's very unique. The first time that I'm aware of, at least, that we read about that is actually not with David, but was at the moment when Samuel was telling King Saul that he was rejected as king, that God could accept him as king no longer. I didn't mean Saul was going to be deposed that very day, but that Saul had crossed the line and was unacceptable in his conduct before God, in his irreverence before God, and uh, this is the occasion where he, he, he didn't listen to Samuel, he went ahead and offered a sacrifice, which was never his responsibility to do to begin with, and he didn't wait on Samuel like he should have, but he, Samuel said when he arrived and found what had been done, he said, you acted foolishly. Samuel said, you've not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. God could have made you a permanent king, a permanent lineage. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and has appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Even though right at that moment, we don't know who that man is it is very clear that God has already made a decision and that God will replace ultimately King Saul with David. And David will be appointed to that role even though no announcement's been made yet because God wanted somebody that is a man after his own heart, a man that considered the will of God, a man that God could look at and know that he had a, a, a desire for God, a love for God, and and in, in uh, place the Lord's will above his own will. We remember that it talks about in Acts chapter 13 at verse 22 that in this sermon that's being preached on that occasion, that they repeat that phrase and said, when he had removed him, of course it's talking about Saul there, he raised up for them David as a king to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who would do my will. So that passage kind of draws together, you know, what was said in the verse we read a minute ago and what God was about to do, and that was a point, King David. So as you think about this, again, even in the New Testament, it speaks of David as the man after God's own heart. I want to talk with you tonight about why that was so and look at a few of those passages that tell us about that. And I think one of the first things that we know about King David was he had a supreme love for the law of God, for the word of God. You see it over and over again. And with each of these points, I'll just kind of give you a few examples of what we see in the scripture and what it tells us about. But you remember that David would write in Psalm 119 at verse 97 and, and really other verses too of, of various psalms. But he says, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Night and day, David said, I have my mind on the law of God. I don't know if you remember. We've, we've read these passages before and talked about it a little bit. But back in the book of Deuteronomy, it, it described that uh, Moses was telling about their future a little bit. One of the things it said was, one day you'll have a king. So it was almost prophetic about that. But one of the things it said that a king should do in the book of Deuteronomy, 
when that day came. It says the king needs to get the law of God, and he, he needs to sit down, and he needs to write out every line of the law of God. He's talking about, of course, not just the Ten Commandments, but all the Old Testament law. He needs to write out every one of those laws, and he needs to keep that before him all the time. And he always needs to be able to contemplate. Well, I, I think David was a man that did something of that nature. It was David's meditation night and day. And it kept David on the right track. Of course, we know how he faltered, and we have evidence of that. And I, I would assume that he got his mind off the meditation of the law of God. And yet, the better part of his life was given towards this pursuit. Let's look at another thing he said in 127. He says, therefore, I love your commandments more than gold. Yes, more than fine gold. I, I, David became, I'm sure, a rich man as a king. He, he began to have a lot, and uh, he was honored in many ways. But you know what? I believe that David really meant that. God's law meant more to David than gold meant. You know, we see later on how Solomon came to the kingdom, and he became rich and multiplied wives even more so than David had, which should have never happened, but of course. We, we see this going on, though, with King Solomon, and we see how wealth and other things begin to kind of corrupt his life and, and his associations with idolatrous women and all of that. But I, I get the impression that in David's life, he was not corrupted by that. And the thing that he kept before him all the time was this idea that God's word meant more to him than anything else in this life. He said again, 167 of Psalm 119, he said, My soul keeps your testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. Oh, how love I thy law, it is my meditation night and day. Now look, I'm not preaching this to acquaint you with King David particularly. I'm talking to you tonight about how to be people after God's own heart. And I don't imagine anybody's a man or woman after God's own heart who can't say with David, I truly love what your teaching tells me. I love the Bible. I love what it says. I love my New Testament. I love to read and study of God's Word. I want it to speak to me and tell me about my life and what needs to happen within it. Oh, how I love I thy law. And it's my meditation all the day long. David set us a good example that we must love the law of God. Jesus said one time that he who rejects me and doesn't receive my words will have one that judges him. The word that I've spoken will judge him in the last day. Now, that's not something that might immediately provoke within you a love for the law, but it shows you just how important the teaching of the New Testament is. This will one day be the standard by which we'll be judged. Everyone sitting here tonight will be judged by what Jesus Christ taught us, and his word will judge us in the last day. Simon Peter had the right idea, even though he made, you know, he made some mistakes, and he had his faults, and, and, and sometimes the Lord had to seriously rebuke Simon. But one of the times in John 6, you've got to kind of read the context there, but in John 6 they have an episode uh, over the, the context of that text where a whole lot of people started following Jesus. And Jesus started preaching some hard things. And he started preaching some controversial things that really were designed to make them look deeper and ask questions and see his importance in their lives. And as he challenged them with all of these things, it says that they began to go away. And during that time period in John 6, he had a mass defection of disciples. And he said they went away and they walked with him no more. And that's when Jesus turned to his apostles and said, Will you go away off of us? And Peter said, Where will we go? Lord, to whom shall we go? You've got the words of eternal life. You can't imagine how potent that thought is, unless you just sit down and contemplate it a minute. There is, a, there is to my mind, just a little bit of, of, of realization, and I, I've, I've felt this way before myself, and that is, this is hard sometimes, and 
it would be easy to say, I, I'm ready to walk away from it all. But Peter knows something. At this stage, Peter grasps something. Where else do I go? I know what I've got here. I know it's challenging me, and I know sometimes I don't, you know, I, I understand that it, it's overwhelming a little bit to, to stop and think about our responsibilities before God. And, and it would be so easy to say, let, let me just get away from all of this. But if what I want is eternal life, where do I go? Other than right here. Because we know who's got the words that will get us to heaven. And it's our Lord Jesus. And so we're being challenged to stop and think about that. And that shows he had a love for the, the teaching of Jesus Christ. I like this statement Peter later made. He said, like newborn babes, we have to long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you grow in respect to salvation. We have to be like a baby that, that's ready to eat, in other words, that craves to eat, and, and that you, you don't have any problem convincing them of their need to eat. Well, he says that's how you need to be about the word of God and that we long for it, and that couldn't be a better explanation of our attitude towards the word of God, to learn to long for it, appreciate it for what it really is. We're told about the fact that, that of the word of God, David, David decided that he would take the word of God and saturate his heart with it. You know, obviously, if you meditate on it, meditate on it night and day, you're probably going to get that response. But as he hid it in his heart, as he kept the word of God bound and tied within his heart, you see what it did. It says in Psalm 119, verse 11, Your word I have hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against you. One of the greatest deterrents as far as David was concerned was the abundance of God's word on our human hearts. Our hearts are sometimes described in the scripture as not so good. Jeremiah said they're desperately wicked. I don't think that necessarily describes every child of God's condition before God, but we know that the, the word of God teaches us that so many of the sources of our problems, Jesus talks about it, the Proverbs talked about it, so many of the sources of our problems emanate out of the heart. They start in the heart. So when you stop and think about that, when he's saying this to us, he's saying, let's get as much of the word of God in our hearts. I don't think that's exactly the same thing as saying it's in your mind. You can know facts you got to get this in your heart, your mind, your heart in the Bible. It's your will, it's your emotions, it's your thinking. It's all of these things combined together, your decision-making capability. Get the Word of God in your heart so that you will not sin against God. It's a great deterrent, he tells us. And then there's a passage in James when you think about David hiding the Word in his heart. James says, lay aside all filthiness an overflow of wickedness, and, was, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. I've always thought that James was using the same idea that Jesus talked about in the parable of the sower, that God's word is like seed, and it needs to be planted. And you know, it, it says in Luke's version about the parable of the sower, it talks about it being received into good and honest hearts and all this. So we understand that, that the word of God, for it to function and accomplish what it needs to, has to go into good and honest hearts. He says that let's take the word of God, but he says let's make the ground accessible to God. I think his analogy is very similar to the parable of the sower because he says if you're going to implant the word in your heart, into your life, then lay aside filthiness and the overflow of wickedness. In the parable of the sower, we all know about the, the seed landing on the ground that thorns and thistles were growing in. And the seed found a little spot to germinate, but the thorns and the thistles competed to the point to where it choked out the word. It, it just wouldn't let any progress be made. And it is the reason we don't go into a garden and sow a few seeds on top of a bunch of weedy area you just don't start a garden that way, and you're not going to have much of a garden if you don't cultivate and try to keep the weeds out. He says some things have to go for the word of God 
to make any progress in our hearts, and that is we have to lay aside. We've got to weed out the filthiness and the overflow of wickedness, the excessive wickedness that inhabits so many humans. And then we have to grow meek and say, God has the answers that I yield to the word of God, and then let it be planted in our hearts, and then it can save your soul. But we can't, folks, we can't. Let the word of God be in our heart and want wicked things. We continue to practice wicked things. We can't go on lying and, and have adulterous thoughts or have uh, you know, a desire to cheat and steal or whatever else it may be. You can't let the word of God get in a heart like that and expect much growth. The best you can hope for is that it might rebuke us and and make us to see where we need to change our ways, but this is not a good situation, and this is why when we're being hypocritical in our lives as Christians and, and we're not letting the word come into our lives and, and benefit us, then we're letting too much else stay in. I think David hid God's word in his heart. But yes, we do. We know about a time when David, he didn't operate by the conviction of the word of God. I don't know what happened to David. I don't know all the details. It doesn't tell us. The only indication it gives us before David's fall with Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite, the only thing I know of that happened during that time, it prefaces all that to saying that it was a time period when kings usually went out to war with their troops and they fought and they behaved as kings are supposed to, and it said David decided not to go. I don't know what that means or why that might have led to the problem. But my speculation from that standpoint is that maybe David got a little used to the life of a king and forgot about that he was also supposed to be a warrior fighting for his men and that he, instead of getting out there and leading his troops, he was perhaps getting a little adapted to the life of, the lux of luxury that a king might live and that he began to think of what pleased him. Now that's just... You know, a little hint of an idea I get out of the text. We don't know what else led up to this, but what we do know is that he, he began to think differently about things. He lost his spiritual uh, input in this life. He, he, I don't know if he laid aside God's word for a while and quit studying, or I, I don't know if he got his mind on other things. I don't know if he began to worry more about what pleased him than what pleased God. I don't know what was happening in his heart. I just know that as David began this downward spiral, that he quit thinking like a spiritual man. He quit referencing the word of God in his heart. And when he made each move, and each move, by the way, as you read through it, is a very deliberate, precise move to do something wrong. It's not just he happened into it. He, he calculated all of this. He saw Bathsheba, and maybe that was somewhat accidental seeing that, I don't know. But then he lingered to watch, and that was a choice. And then he sent representatives down, his own people down, to arrange for her to come to him, knowing what that would do to his reputation. And then he went into a relationship with her, an ungodly fashion been ungodly under a lot of circumstances, but this was a married woman and he was a married man, yet he took another man's wife as just to enter into a terrible relationship of adultery. Then he calculated as she became pregnant, expecting a child, he calculated how could he eliminate the problem and he deceived her husband and he did anything he could to set it up to where it looked like it was his child the man's child, Uriah's child, and then he calculated clearly what he could do to the man to get him into battle so that that man would most likely be killed. And he set all of that up. And you know, his army commander kind of rebuked him about it and said, you're sending one of our best men into that situation. And he said, well, you know what? The sword devours one as another. That, that, that's just a way of saying, well, you know, people die in battle, it might as well be him because that would be of a convenient thing for me. I'm telling you all these bad things about David that was the man after God's own heart, but I assure you of one thing, 
During these hours, he's not the man after God's own heart. We've got a guy that's faltering and going out of control and doing horrific things. And I cannot believe during those hours that he is meditating on the laws of God night and day. Or they would have rebuked him. Something's happened. The Bible doesn't give us that kind of insight to say, well, this is exactly where David went wrong or whatever. I mean, you can see it step by step. But, but somewhere or another, he let these things enter his heart and life. And it corrupted David. Now, I'll give David the credit, and that is that, that when David was confronted, he made things right. That'll be one of our points that we want to talk about. Let me talk for a minute about David, the man who loved to praise God, because I do think sometimes we find a little inconsistency. Uh, how does a man who loves the law of God, and loves God, and loves to praise God, how does he wind up like that? And uh, we'll get to that in a minute, a little bit more about that. But David loved the praise of Almighty God. This is one of the main things that Psalms comes out in. Psalms, uh, he, he talks about frequently this very, this very thought. And I, I, I do want to say, we won't go over all the Psalms, obviously, tonight and go into intricate detail, but give the Psalms a chance sometimes. Go, go read them. Spend some time looking at the Psalms. And one of the things I want you to notice about him is David writes these Psalms that a lot of times at various stressful times of his life. These are hard times. He's going through difficulties. And in many of these psalms, if you'll stop and read for a minute, he's talking about the, the difficulty that he's in. And sometimes he's even very honest that he kind of feels as if he's been abandoned. And then before the psalm is over, he has either corrected it or he's stated how he felt, but that he was wrong about that and he knew that the Lord could be trusted. And it, there, there are psalms that praise God and realize that he could depend on God even sometimes if it seemed like he wasn't. And we don't want to ever forget, David went through some really, really rough years, really rough things that, that he had to go through before he even became king. One of the things David said, and he says, I will praise you. Talking to God, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows well. You know, to me, that is a text that leaps out in God's word. And it's very, very much like Psalm 19 when he said, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And, and David looks at his own life, and he looks at God's work in it. But, but beyond that, he looks at what God has done in creating him and how he is, lives upon this earth and all that God has done. And, and David, without knowing the intricate things that we now know even about the human body, says of it, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. This isn't a brag. It's a boast about God. He's not saying, I am that alone. He's saying, I realize what God has made when he made man. I, I'm appreciative of it. What? God has created, how marvelous all his works are. You know, at a time when we've got fellows running around who can't see clearly, though educated men, they can't see clearly that we live in a world that was made, that was designed, that shows design. David is just an ordinary shepherd, but he sees it everywhere. David looks into the heavens and he sees the glory of God. David looks at creation. He looks at his own life and body. And he says, I'm created. I'm wonderfully made. And it makes him want to praise God for all these things. And David saw God as not only his creator, but his savior and his helper in all things. The spirit of David could be a lesson to any Christian in that he says to him the opportunity to worship was a glorious thing. This was a busy man. He has constant things going on in his life. He has all kind of responsibilities that are heavy upon him. But to have somebody say, it's time to go to the house of God, or somebody even to invite him, come, let's go up to the house of God. He says, anytime I can, I'm glad. I was glad when they said unto me, let's go into the house of God. I was glad when I could have an opportunity for that. I was glad that I could be a part of worship because David's heart was in those kind of places. He saw God as one of worship. And so, you know, David writes so many of our psalms and 
We get into the New Testament and he tells us, you know, we need to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly in wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We, you know, we read, we read that about uh, the word, I've hidden my heart that I might not sin against thee. Well, how about Christ and Christ's word and teaching dwelling in us in a rich fashion, in abundance? And he says, admonishing, teaching one another in psalms, David's type of writings, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. I don't think, even though there are different systems of worship for sure, but I don't think David's spirit is far removed from what a Christian spirit needs to be about worshiping Almighty God, being glad to worship, being happy to be together at the Lord's Day, being glad we have the opportunity to lift up our voices in songs of praise. Now, I was talking earlier about David's sin. You may say, well, if David said, Thy word I've hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee, if David said that, then it must have failed him. Well, I, I suppose in a sense it did. I don't think God's word failed. I think David failed it. But if David piled up the word of God in his heart, why did he go do these terrible things? That's a good question. But before you get real hard on David, you know the truth. Why have you ever sinned? Why have you done things wrong? Well, if you know something against yourself, why would you do that for? You say, well, I didn't go commit adultery. Did you lie? <laughs> did you not come to church when you could have come to church? Did you do this? Did you do that? You know, we can name a thousand things up here. It, did you do that? Then, then you stepped over a line. What, what did you do? Well, if you did those things, why did you do them? If you knew they were wrong, why did you do them? Because at that moment, getting to do the wrong thing was easier or more pleasing or something about it led us into that activity and we did that and we did wrong. Now, we're told in the New Testament that, that the things in the Word of God are written that we may not see. And I like how John puts it. He said, I'm writing these things that you may not see. Them. But if any man sins, he's got an advocate with the Father. That's something to stop and think about. We are not to sin, but when we sin, here's what we need to do. Now, I would hope that we would not sin because every sin leads to consequence and it could be hurtful in our lives and these things could come back to haunt us. But, but here's something to stop and think about. There is a next big question when sin comes into our lives as it will in every Christian's case, as it did Peter, as it did other men of faith, Sin is now in our lives. We have botched things. We have messed up. So what's the next move? And some might say, cover it as much as you can. Hide it and keep it as silent. Don't let anybody know about it. Don't do anything about it. Deny it, whatever. David had the word in his heart. And when it became a confrontation and the prophet of God came to David and and, and kind of a little bit set him up by making him think about another story and, and revive the interest of what, right, what was right and wrong in his heart. And, and David said, you know, man, I, that fellow you're talking about, well, I'll just take him out and kill him, but that at least you ought to make him pay fourfold back for all the wrong that he's done. And, and that's when Nathan the prophet says, well, fellow, you're the guy I'm talking about. And all of a sudden, bam, it hits David and he sees. The devil had pulled the wool over his eyes for a period of time. But the first words out of David's mouth is, I have sinned. And I know you can say that and not mean it, and you can say it and be irre you know, irreverent about it. Oh, yeah, I've sinned, I've sinned. Too bad. But there are those who say it and mean it. And David said, I've sinned. And the next words out of the Lord's mouth is, I have taken away your sin. That quick, you know. Well, David, I'll put you on probation for 52 weeks. We'll see what you do. No, I'll take away your sin. Now, please be advised, God said, 
everything that's a natural consequence and maybe then some of your sin is going to fall on you. You're going to have trouble with your family and all these other things. I'm not taking that away. You'll have to gracefully bear the consequences of all your sins. But as far as you and I are concerned, you've acknowledged your sin and shown that you're truly repentant, and I'll take it away. And that settles it with God. And take away every problem we face in life. Well, David would write later on about this instant, and if you look at Psalm 51, it, it, it opens by saying this is about David's sin with Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite and all that. One of the things David said, he penned this psalm. It, you know, you say, well, where does David get off saying, okay, I sin, and that be the end of the story. He said, that's, that's really not the end of the story. David sat down and penned this psalm, and he says, I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me. He wrote a good many verses all about his sin. I want you to stop and think about this is a king. This is a guy that's over the land that everybody looks to. And David wrote something that everybody in Israel could read. And David said, I'm wrong. I stepped over a line. I violated God's will. I sinned against God by sinning against those he forbade me to be part of. Going into to Bathsheba by having Uriah the Hittite set up to be killed in battle, I sinned against God. I broke God's law. I'm not sugarcoating this. I'm not going to tell you uh, 101 reasons why I got into this bad situation. It's just the facts. I did it, and I'm wrong. That's what Psalm 51 is all about. I have sinned against the Lord. And David clearly saw that. So when we come into the New, the New Testament, he says, confess your trespasses to one another. I fear that sometimes somebody sit back there thinking, oh, that's my business, not the business of the church. Think. David didn't sit around saying, that's my business, I'll tend to it. Everybody else needs to keep their own, you know, nose out of my business, David. Put it out there before the land and said, I'm wrong. I broke God's law. And we confess our trespasses to one another so that we can pray for one another so that we can be healed spiritually. That's the thought because the effective prayer of a righteous man will avail much and that we can be forgiven of our sins. If we confess our sins, God, just as he forgave David, will be faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is our hope. There are other thoughts, too. Man, my time's wound up, and I, I really think I'm going to have to kind of draw it to a close. But, but one of the things David said is, i got to watch my mouth. I will guard my tongue. I'll guard my ways lest I sin with my tongue. I will restrain my mouth with the muzzle while the wicked are before me, Psalm 39, verse 1. Let no corrupt word, the New Testament says, proceed out of your mouth. Just what's good for necessary edification so that it will impart grace unto the hearers. Look, here's a spirit that we need to get. I'll, I'll have to close on this point, please. He says in Psalm 119, verses 104, through your precepts I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. There's some other scriptures that kind of talk about that same thing. We're told in the New Testament to, to cleave to what's good and reject and abhor what is evil. David said, I, I begin to understand God's point of view. And I want to tell you that, that becoming a Christian, at first we don't quite see it that way. You come, but you become a Christian, you don't understand sometimes some of these things. But when you begin to study the precepts of God and understand by precepts, young people, he just means the laws, the teachings of God. You begin to see God's point of view, how God thinks about certain things. And, and with my love and my commitment to God, talking about you and me personally, when we sit back and say what God wants and what God thinks is the most important thing in the world to me, when we get that perspective and we study and see what God wants, then when there is something that is sinful and, and terrible and wicked and false and all of that, 
you can't love that thing anymore. You cannot get your mind around where that could be good. And it is not that you hate a person because they do that sin, but you hate that wrong. It's wicked and it's evil and it's not to be uh, compromised with because it is sinful. That This helps us a lot, by the way, because it, it, it teaches us and shows us that we, we learn to get a disgust for ungodly conduct. You know, what we don't want to do, and I don't want to reiterate all this all over again, but we don't want to get in the mindset that David did for that period of time, get in the mindset of, because when Nathan came in, David could be made to see in another person what was wrong, but he hadn't seen it clearly about himself. And only when he was cornered with the truth did David say, you know what, I, I have sinned. He saw it, and he could see it clearly then. But folks, and, and I know we'll fall prey to this at one time or another, but we must continue to study, examine, look, think, listen to the word of God so that it gets so in our hearts and, and that our disgust with evil and false ways and, and sinful ways that those things don't look appealing any longer to us because they are repulsive. And we see why God thinks they're repulsive. And we say they're repulsive. And they don't allure us any longer. Get a good picture of sin. That's why God sometimes gives us a real graphic view of these kind of things in the Bible so that we'll learn to get disgusted at wicked ways. Well, we'll call a halt to it right there. If you need to obey the gospel or be restored in Christ, come this evening. We'd be privileged to baptize you and see you enter into the Lord Jesus. Or we would love to see you if you're a Christian that needs to correct your ways. Pray together to the passage that we read about earlier as you confess and acknowledge sin. Let's stand at this time.